Oh, what trouble we're in. You know, what's, what's quite funny is um, Rebecca said to me, I hope you're not talking on this or this today because I'm sharing communion, so please stay clear of those verses and, and what I'm talking about. I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And, uh, but it's funny how God works because I didn't hear her message and she hasn't heard the message that I believe God's placed on my heart. And uh, you'll find during this message that there's an overlap. So I'm going to tell Rebecca, God had other plans. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father, Lord God, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, that you love us. Lord, that you brought us here today, Lord, together as church, as family. And Lord, right now we just pray, Lord, that you open our hearts, you open our ears. Lord, not to be distracted by the things of outside, but Lord, to hear your voice. Lord, to hear it, to meditate on it, to eat it, Father, Lord God. Lord, and to obey it. Father, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that your message is clear. And we bless everyone today. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Okay, so if I'm going to give you a verse for today, this verse is not the same as Rebecca's, so I'm safe so far. It's Zechariah 4.6. You don't need to go there. Most of you will know it. But it says, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by might, not by power but by the Spirit, says the Lord. Uh, recently, I had the privilege um, to share some time at a men's fellowship. And uh, every year, my dad invites me to this fellowship. It's a father-son thing, and we also invite others um, to come, non-believers, so it's an opportunity to witness and to share. And... Uh, on this event, so I was there, and uh, every, for the last probably 10 years, I've been doing this event, and I've gotten to know some of the men in uh, my father's church quite well, and they have sons. And I was uh, there this Friday night. We had a fire going, because I love camping. That's where we were. We were having a nice fire. It was a little bit of rain, and it was getting late at night, and I said to one of my father's friends, I said, hey, where's your son? And he goes, oh, sorry? He goes, I said, where's your son? He's normally here. And he goes, oh, no, he's coming. I just don't know when. And I was like, well, that's a bit strange. So I kind of pondered on that again. And then I leaned across and I said, so how come you don't know when he's coming? And he said to me, well, he, uh, he went to, he flew to Fiji about six weeks ago. And from Fiji, he was then going to sail all the way from Fiji on this yacht. Guess where the yacht's from? The Sydney and Hobart races. What was my wife just talking about? Gee, there's a bit of an overlap. But anyway, he was telling me that his son was, was going to fly to Fiji and he was going to join some mates of his from a yacht. And they were going to sail back to Sydney. But that was about... Uh, Six weeks ago, five, six weeks ago. So that was the last he heard. So he hadn't heard from his son because he's on a yacht coming back to Australia. And he knows that it's very important that he gets to this event because it's a father-son event. And I was getting real baffled. And I said to, I said to this man, I said, well, how come you don't know exactly what time he's coming? I mean, when's he coming back into Sydney? When's he landing? And he looked over me again with a gleam in his eye. And he said, Damien... It's a sailing ship. Uh, it depends on the wind, on when my son is going to get here. I can't determine it. You can't determine it. It's the wind and the guy who's sailing that's going to determine when he gets here. So I'm happy as long as he gets here safe. But it's up to the wind. And uh, right away I get so interested in hearing those things and it really spoke to me that hearing that it wasn't on the time that we wanted or they plotted this time it was all dependent on the wind all something out of everyone else's control and um, sure enough 
the guy turned up. He turned up to the event the next morning. He was there. And uh, so I made sure I took some time because I love sailing. I, I haven't been sailing, but I love hearing all, all this stuff, adventures about sailing. I mean, it's an amazing thing, right? Um, you, you think about it. Sailing ships are probably the only vessels that you can think of that, that uh, can transport around the world through the power of wind. It's got no engine, and yet people have been able to circumnavigate the globe. They've been able to settle colonies, all through a vessel that has no power of its own. None. And the captains and the crews have to be equipped on how to grab whatever ever wind they can get to move that boat to move that vessel. And as I was talking to this young man about his trip, I said, how come you're late? And he goes, well, the trip was meant to take three weeks, but it took us five or six. And it was all because of the weather, the conditions, and plus he stopped to buy a couple of good islands where they decided to spend a bit more time. But it's amazing that we have a vessel that through the power of the wind, not by its own power, can get to ports and locations. And so I asked him, I said, how is it that you fly, I'm sorry, that you took a yacht all the way from Fiji down the coast of Australia to here in Sydney? I mean, do you have to wait till the wind is going the direction? Like, is there a wind that goes from Fiji to Sydney? Does everybody else probably a bit smarter than me? But. Did you know how, how yachts work? So I, I got intrigued by all of this. And I might just ask my brother if he's got, got a quick picture. I'm not going to teach you about yachts because I'm not an expert by no means. I might just lose a, a light. So I just, here's a picture of a yacht or a, a sailing ship. Are there any sailors here? I know my, my father-in-law was a bit of a sailor. <laughs> on the right, I don't know if you can see it too much, I'm going to stand over here, but I always thought that this is the, the direction of the wind, so imagine you're looking down on the boat or you're looking down on a yacht, and I always thought that the boat could only ever really travel with the wind. Who thought that? Did anyone think that? Or you're much smarter than me. Everyone's smarter than me, that's not a surprise. Okay. <laughs> you guys are a bit more educated than me. So. What I learned by talking to this young man was that he said, you know, Damien, you can go anywhere. You can travel and sail a yacht anywhere as long as you have wind. That's all you need. As long as you've got wind in your sails, you can go any direction. Any direction. Did you know that? That, that just blows my mind that even if the wind is coming against you, an expert sailor, as long as he's got wind hitting that sail, he can turn that boat and he can get to a port up here. He can get to a port up there because he does manoeuvres like tacking and jibing and all these fancy words that I don't know what they do. But the only manoeuvre they can never ever do is sail into the wind. There's 11 manoeuvres on a yacht or a ship, 11 of them. And there's only one you cannot do, and that's sail directly into the wind. It's called in irons. In irons, which means you're not going anywhere. It's like being ironed into a jail cell and you ain't going anywhere. So that's the only manoeuvre. So we can take that down now because otherwise everyone's going to fall asleep. It got me thinking more and more about sailing this passion and I love listening to these things. And I was, I was gone, I went back to a time where I was speaking to uh, an older couple. They were very tired. So the children had grown up, they'd left the nest, they got married. So they started to have a little bit more money. So for, for those of you who have children, 
you do get some money back when they leave, I hear. All right, that's what I'm hearing. So anyway, this, this couple who were retiring, they had this dream of buying this sailboat, and they had this dream of just sailing the wet Sundays. You know, up near Queensland, the beautiful tropical weather, going from island to island, and just having a great time. Now, they'd never had a yacht before. They're probably a bit like me, a bit of a novice. And they decided, yep, we're going to buy a sailing boat. So they bought a sailing boat. Brand new. Bought a car trailer to tow it as well, because you need to get it from where you bought it into the water. And then they needed uh, a full drive to tow it. So it started costing a bit, but you know, the kids had moved on and they saved and they were going after their dream. And uh, I remember my brother said, Damien, you've got to talk to this couple. And I said, why? They said, they went and bought this yacht and they took it sailing, but they've got a story to tell you. And you know I love stories. So I, I raced over to them and my brother introduced me and I said, I heard you bought a yacht. Tell me all about it. And they looked at me with absolute terror. I'm telling you, they looked at me with terror. They're like, you want to hear about our yacht experience? I'm like, yeah, tell me about it. It must be amazing. Good on you guys for doing that. And they're like, no, 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 shut this down. Well, that was not. And I was, I was like, well, hang on, how come my brother sent me over here to hear about this shot story? And these people don't even want to talk about it. I'm like, what happened? And they said, well, we got this brand new yacht. Never been used. And we... We took it to the boat ramp and, you know, my wife, she, she was very nervous, but she was in the car and she was reversing it down. And uh, I hopped on the boat and we thought that, you know, that was going to be the tricky bit. But, you know, we got the boat off and we got it into this calm bay, beautiful bay in Queensland, protected. The conditions were perfect. The water was nice and there was a nice wind. Couldn't have asked for a better day. Like, this is sounding good. So they get this sailing boat off the car, the car trailer. She parks it, they both get on this sailing boat and they head out to the bay. Okay, they're out in the bay and he says, you know what, Damien? I said, no, what happened? He goes, for the next 45 minutes, my wife and I were staring at each other with the whites of our eyes saying, what have we done? I said, what? And they said, well, when we were out there, every time we put that sail up to catch the wind, the boat would begin to capsize. Every time they put the sail up. I was like, whoa, that doesn't make sense. Was the boat broken? Did, what happened? And he goes, let me tell you guys, for 45 minutes, every time we put the sail up, we would go to capsize. Then I'd quickly bring the sail down, and then it right, would come back up. Then I'd try again, and he goes, but I, had, I couldn't steer. I said, why couldn't you couldn't steer? And he goes, you know, he goes, we sat there for 45 minutes, always looking to go over. And he said, our strength was getting pulled. We were going to head into stuff. We, we knew we were gone. I was like, wow, after this dream, you're out on a perfectly brand new yacht, and every time you go to put your sail up, you almost kill yourself. Every time you take the sail down, you've got no control or direction to get to safety, not even to get back into the bay. You are literally dead ducks in water. <laughs> Sorry for the ducks. And so I said, so what happened? How did you get out of it? And he said, by the grace of God, this, this other uh, vessel saw their struggles and saw the whites of their eyes and their screams for help, came, tied a, boat to, tied a rope to their boat and took them back into the safety of the shore. <coughs> they tied the boat, they put the boat on the car trailer and took it back out. And he began, they began to explain to this experienced sailor who said, what, what's going on? What's happening with your boat? Is it broken or whatever? And as they took the boat out of the water, the experienced sailor walks around the boat. He walks around it. 
And uh, he comes back to this couple and they say, there's, there's nothing wrong with your boat. Nothing wrong with your boat. And he said, well, well, how come we couldn't sail? When we put the sails up, the wind's not even strong, it's not even a storm. But every time we put the sails up, we'd go over. And I had no steering, I couldn't steer. It's the scariest thing in my life, I'm never doing this again. And the sailor said, come over here. And he went to the boat and he said, what's that? And the guy said, what do you mean, what's what? He goes, that's the centerboard. Do you know what a centerboard is? Mm -hmm. A centerboard's like the keel of your boat. So if your boat capsizes, or you need steering, a keel keeps your boat stable. And it's the centerboard. If you have a look at that picture, brother, if you can do that one more time. I don't want to fall over. I might need a keel. <laughs> but if you have a look at that boat, down the bottom, this is called a centerboard. It's the centerboard. And the centerboard helps that boat's stability and steer. The other thing that they'd forgotten to do is ballast. Anyone know what ballast is? Uh, ballast is when you put weight into the bottom of your boat because that too keeps it stable. So if it starts to roll, the weight of your ballast brings it back upright. And so this couple who had bought this brand new yacht took it out on the water first time, forgot to put the centerboard and the ballast into their yacht and as a result almost died. Almost died. And it was only because another vessel passed them and was able to rescue, tow them and bring them back. Now why am I sharing this message with you today? Why am I sharing it? Well, the sad thing is, is that couple, you know what they did after that incident? They sold the boat. And I tell you, someone got a nice new boat for not a lot of money. Only ever been used once. But how sad. This couple had such a terrifying event that they'd given up on their dream, given up on this adventure and traded it in for a speedboat. Isn't that sad? And when I think about today as Christians, how often do we run through life, we run into things that we're just not equipped with and we give up on God? We give up on God because we want to power it ourselves. Because we don't take the time to learn from God. We don't take the time to learn about our vessels. You know, the Bible in 2 Timothy describes us as vessels. Do you know that you don't believe in You can read 2 Timothy, it's in there. Describes us as vessels. And as vessels, we carry something. And the Bible verse today says, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. All of us have got a journey. We are vessels. We are traveling this world. We go from location, from destination to another. We often put schedules and times on it. And we run into stuff. And I don't know about your situation today or your situations, but I've had times in my life where I thought I was doing everything right. I had the brand new yacht. I had everything that I thought I needed. But because I'd missed the crucial part, I was struggling. And today, I believe that message is for us to learn how through the vessels, all of us have been given a vessel, this vessel that we're in, 
Some are prettier than others. Some are stronger than others. Some are a bit weathered. See by the grey hair and the wrinkles. But we've all been made a vessel and designed. And if we don't know how to make life's journey through the vessel that we have and through what God gives us, then how do we get to our journeys and our destination? You know, in Proverbs, it says, man plots, a man's heart plots his course, but God determines his steps. So today, I'm going to take you through a couple of little points on how, on how we can learn how to navigate this world. Not to give up, not to do it on our own strength. So the first thing, we've, all dis we've just, just discussed that we're all vessels, okay? Every single one of us here is a vessel, all right? And there's some things that can sink this vessel, aren't there? Now in a ship, there's two things that can sink a vessel, right? What's the first one? Rocks, but what does a rocks cause? A hole. Alright, so the first thing that can sink your vessel is a hole. Yeah? It's a small hole, big hole, it doesn't matter. If your boat is taking on water, it's only a matter of time. And the other one is capsize. If you capsize your boat and it stays over, you can't sail, it starts taking on water. And you can't sail a submarine, it's at the bottom. And so, the first one I want to give you, Proverbs 3.32. For the Lord detests the perverse, but takes the upright into his confidence. Make a mental note, upright. Proverbs 11.3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. When we look at these two verses... One of the most important things that you ever need with your vessel is to keep your vessel afloat. Everyone, everyone together say to me, keep your vessel afloat. So you can keep it upright. Keep your vessel afloat so you can keep it upright. So one of the most important things we can learn as Christians is that this vessel needs to have integrity. Whatever you come up against, whatever waves, whatever challenges, if you have a big wave, you need a strong vessel to take that wave. Whatever you come up against, your vessel needs to have integrity. Your vessel can't have holes in it. But let me tell you, we live in a world where we're going to come up against the enemy. And the enemy wants to put holes in your boat. He wants to put holes in your vessel so that you can't go forward, so that you sink. And he is actively doing that all the time. You also have other vessels. And we bump into each other. We collide. Sometimes it's by accident, but we cause holes. And when we get holes in our vessels, what do we need to do? We need to, what do we need to do? We need to fix them up. And so practical applications in our life for identifying holes, it's very, very easy. How do you know if you've got a hole in the boat? You've got water inside it. And you have to bail. You have to bail. I remember a long time ago, I was in a canoe. And I remember the instructors, there was about three or four canoes and there was a group of us. And they said, get into the canoes and we're going to go up to that point. Everyone stay away from the red one. Being a typical boy, red at that time was my favourite colour because red ones go faster. And we're going to have a canoe race. So, uh, three of us, three of my friends, we grabbed this red canoe 
and we started off, we was the first person to head to the point up on the other side of the bay and to come back. Well, I should have listened to our instructors. Because by the time we started getting to the point and racing the other canoes, our canoe was three quarters full of water. We were taking on water. And the only way that we got back, and I tell you what, it was a miracle, was we had to have one person continually bailing water to keep that water below the waterline. And so by the time we got this canoe up and we were coming back, we came last because, hey, we had a lot of water in our canoe. We were exhausted. And our boat pretty much had sunk by the time we got to the sand back in the bay. But as Christians, are we spending our life bailing water? Are we continually feeling like we're always trying to bail out and we're exhausted? Is it our finances? Have we got a hole in our finances? Have we got more bills coming in than going out, sorry, than what we've got coming in? I've been there. And let me tell you, as Christians, doesn't matter if you're Christian or not, all of us through our life take on water. We take it on just by in general life, by what we come up against, what we go through, we all take on water. But it's how we respond to taking on water that's going to see us in our journey. Amen? So learn to bail. Learn to bail out. But most importantly, learn to find those holes. Learn to find those holes in your vessel. And we learn that by searching ourselves. By having our friends, our pastors, our leaders also advice. Hey, you know what? You're doing great there. But I think you need to work on this. I think you need to work on your relationship with your husband. I think you need to work on your relationship with your brother. Because that's pulling you down. We've got to fix those holes. And so sometimes that means you've got to stop sailing. You've got to head to port. You've got to pull the vessel out. And you've got to plug that hole. Capsizing. This is the one that I find interesting. Did you know that almost every modern sail ship today has a keel and a ballast centreboard that will help it upright? And I don't know how many times in our Christian life where you come across something and you feel like you've just been laid out. And it seems like there's no getting up. But there is. And it's through the Word. And it's through God that He can upright us. When you have the Holy Spirit on your heart, when you have the foundation, when you see that you are unstable, you can use the word to stabilize. You can use healing to bring you upright so that you can sail. But if we don't have that center board, the center of our life around this, coming upright is almost impossible. I want to turn to Romans 8, 5 to 13. Romans 8, verses 5 to 13. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit in life and is life and peace. For the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I'm just going to stop there for a moment. We can go on to the others. But 
But I'm just going to start again, verse 5. It says, For those who live according to their flesh, to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. If I was to ask you today, what is your mind set to? What is your mind set to or set on? Last night, as I was preparing for bed, I wanted to make sure I got up early so I could spend time again praying and and reviewing today's message. But to do that, I had to set something. I set my alarm clock. If you're going to determine whether your mind is set on something, you need to do something in your mind. It starts here. You need to set it. Because when you set your mind to something, you can achieve it. And here we can see in the Bible that if you set your mind, and often we can be lazy in setting our mind, can't we? But today I want to ask, what is your mind set to? Is it set to the flesh or set to the spirit? Now the flesh is talking about our earthly body, isn't it? Our earthly body that is not infinite. It craves food. It craves water. It craves air. It needs energy. And often those things are telling our spirit, hey, let's just sit down. You need to rest. Or if, uh, who was at The Overcomer the other night? That was a good movie. Yeah, that was a good movie. I love that. That was such a great movie in how a young girl was doing a marathon and the father is coaching in her ear saying, hey, your body's telling you to stop. Your body is telling you to stop. But don't listen to it. Don't surrender to it. For the spirit is greater than the flesh. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. What are you setting your mind to? We need to have a mindset on the spirit of God. A mindset that says, Lord, I'm putting my plans in your hands. I'm putting my plans before you and I'm going to check with them. Check you before I do them. I'm going to put them before you. Is your mind doing that today? Or is your mind craving the things of the world? Are you trying to do the things that you think the mind or the body wants? Maybe it's fame. Maybe it's that holiday. Maybe it's that good time. But those things are earthly. And we know that if we don't have the right mindset, one mindset's not going to make it. The flesh isn't going to make it. And so learning to put that mindset in. So there's some applications to to put in a mindset. One is preparing. When you're set on something, you make time for it, don't you? You see uh, bodybuilders. Bodybuilders are set on getting big. They're set on getting as big as possible, maximizing their muscle. And so they have a mindset of, I'm going to get big. And because they have a mindset, they do all the research they can on what's going to maximise them getting big. They go out and they eat the right foods. They eat plenty of protein. They don't eat junk food. They do plenty plenty of strength training. Not aerobics or anaerobics but they do strength training. You won't see them on a treadmill for four hours or doing a 40 kilometer marathon. But bodybuilders have got a mindset that I'm gonna get big and I'm gonna do everything I can to get big. I'm gonna give this body everything it can 
to maximise size. And when you have a spirit mindset, you're going to do everything you can to get in front of God and to hear His Word. And that means putting this into our vessels, meditating on His Word, training ourselves, putting our faith into action and learning, spending time with God. If you're not doing those things, then I think we need to have another look at our mindset. And if that's you today, then I suggest we do a mind reset. Amen? All right. The next one, set sail. Setting sail, I very much believe, is the faith and us hearing God's voice. And we can't hear God's voice if we're not if we're not connected. And I wish I could tell you this, and maybe it's worked for others, I haven't heard too many, but just one prayer or just coming to the altar one day and saying, God, I want to hear your voice and praying for it, praying, Lord, I want to hear your voice. I have an experience where it just happens straight away. And that's because I believe God is interested in a relationship with you and I. He's not interested in just someone coming up and just saying, hey, I need your help, and then I'll come back when I need it. He wants a relationship with you and I. For those who are married, how many of you went out one day, saw your, your husband and said, yep, he's the one? Took him on a date, and then from there on they knew it was love. From that moment you knew it was love. Anyone been like that? Oh, man. Wow, it doesn't happen like that in the movies then, huh? No, it doesn't. The thing is, you learn to love. I remember seeing Rebecca going, well, yep, she's pretty fine. And then spending two years trying to figure out how to actually talk to her. To say hello, maybe, or get her attention. Thank you, my sister-in-law on the back here. She helped me through that. <laughs> but you don't develop love overnight. And you don't develop a relationship. A relationship is commitment. A relationship is spending time. And you won't be able to put a date or time on when that love or that relationship is strong. But if it's over time, one day you'll look back and go, hey, yep, I'm in love. And if you've got that kind of commitment with the Lord, where you're spending time, you know, just by starting that journey every day, you're going to see and experience that love. You're going to see where he's been active in your life. Often I look back and at the times when I thought God was not there, that was when he was there the most. But it took me a journey, commitment and time to realise it. And that's how we develop. It's all about time and commitment. What you put in is what you're going to get out. Amen? So being committed... The other part to knowing God's voice, you know, in the scriptures it says, the sheep hear my voice and obey me and follow me. But you can't know the voice if you don't talk to it or you don't hear it that often. You know, many of you here, we've all got phones, don't we? And we can't use that phone unless it's connected. So uh, if you're like me and you're at an airport somewhere, traveling overseas, you don't like to use roaming data because you don't want a bill of three or $4,000. Anyone got stuck with that? No? I do a lot of traveling. So when I'm traveling, I'm often in an airport and I'm like, how am I gonna communicate back home? So I, I turn the Wi-Fi and I'm looking for a, for a Wi-Fi connection at the airport. And uh, I don't like the ones with padlocks because that needs a password. And I don't know that one. Not unless someone gives it to me. 
So often I look for free ones, you know, the ones that you can connect and maybe you have to log on and they start telemarketing you with emails or something like that. But the point is, when you have a connection with something, you need to authenticate. So that's a big word this morning, authenticate. But we need to lock onto that signal. And the only way you do that is there's an exchange. And while you've got that signal and you're authenticated, so this phone knows that it's, it's locked onto that Wi-Fi, you've got open channel. But as soon as you lose that signal or that authentication's gone, you've got to go through that whole process. And my point being this morning that is if you're going to establish a relationship with God, you've got to learn that you're establishing a relationship with God. And the only authentication that he's given us is one of two things, our Bible. When you hear the Lord's voice, you believe you're hearing the Lord's voice, maybe it's quiet in your spirit, but does it align with what's in his word? Because that's a good way to check if, hey, this is from God, can I authenticate it? Is it legitimate from here? Or is it just me? The other is prayer. Who here gets conviction when you pray? When you pray, you really, really pray on something. And that Lord gives you that conviction in your spirit. It just pulls. And it's not, not a fleeting moment, but it's something that becomes strong. The Holy Spirit is convicting us. And brothers and sisters, that's the authentication of the Holy Spirit. That's the signal that says, hey, this is me. Listen and obey. Learn to hear his voice, big or small. Just like sailors, how they use the wind, whatever bit of wind they get, they turn that into power to move their vessel. <coughs> And not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. My third point is navigating. So third point, so the first point was the first point, float the boat, keep it upright. Second point, set sails, set your mind and the Spirit. And the third one is navigating. As I mentioned before in Proverbs, Proverbs says, a man's heart plans his course, but God determines his steps. You know, there's a term often used in sailing that uh, you can get stuck around the equator. And you get stuck around the equator because uh, in the equator, there's not many winds. It's very flat and quiet. So many sailors get stuck there. And do you know what they call that? It's a sailing term. They call it the doldrums. Has anyone heard the word, are you in the doldrums? Yes, my mum and dad used it quite a bit. I think it might be an old English term. I don't know. <laughs> but when my parents used to say, hey, how come you're in the doldrums? Do you know what I was usually doing for them to say that? I'd be sitting somewhere with a frown on my face, <coughs> just sitting there looking a little sad and depressed. Not myself, not doing anything, just sitting, looking sorry for myself. Yeah? What was that, sorry? I didn't get my way, I didn't get that lolly. I didn't get that toy that I asked mum and dad that I really, 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 really wanted right now. And I'd get in the doldrums, the sulks. And often in our Christian walk and our journey, you're going to come to points where you're going to be in the doldrums. Because, hey Lord, I really, really, really want this and I prayed for it. I've set my mind on it, I've set it on you, Lord, I've put it before you, and it's just not happening. So we're going to the doldrums. You ever been like that? I can tell you about three events where I had the doldrums. 
I can tell you at age 17, I was in the doldrums because this boy was too afraid to talk to girls. He was too afraid to talk to the mighty fine girl that walked past him in church called Rebecca. And so I was in the doldrums. I was like, God, this, I want to, I want to talk to this girl. I want to impress her so that she thinks I'm awesome and she wants to go out with me. But no, I was in the doldrums and it didn't happen just by me praying. I was in the doldrums. But I'm, I'm married to her now. Amen. So there's the doldrums. I can tell you that um, when Rebecca and I were married, we, I had a vision, I had a dream that I'd have three girls. I've shared this before. I had a dream that I was going to have three girls. But when we decided to have children, um, it didn't happen in the movies the way that it, that it seems to happen. You know, it just happens just like that. No. And I can tell you how many times I was in the doldrums. And I'd have even ones here saying, hey, don't, don't wait too long to have kids. We're trying. <laughs> Please don't ask me. <laughs> And so I was in the doldrums. But look today, has God fulfilled his promise? My word he has. I won't go on to too many. I could share doldrums that I've had. But I'll probably embarrass my family and I'll get shot afterwards. And then I'll be in the doldrums. But the point is... The point, why do I bring this up? The point is, there's going to be times in your life where you're going to be pressing into God and you're going to want things. But the thing is, our flesh wants things in the schedule and time that we want now. But like my friend the other weekend, he was like, why isn't he here now? Well, it's, it's up to the wind, Damien. Well, it's up to God. It's in God's time. If he's promised you something, it's going to happen. But it's in his time, not yours. In his. Be patient. Learn to wait on the Lord. When you wait on the Lord, if your sails aren't filling up and you're not moving, just get more into him. Get into his word. Strengthen your faith. Go fishing. That feed because he's giving you that time to strengthen he's giving you that time of peace and when that time does come you will know it's from him not from your own strength not from your own might because you wanted it now and you're just going to do it but you'll know it's from him and it's the greatest lesson I've learnt is to wait on the Lord <coughs> Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. So this morning as we uh, get the musicians up, putting this all together, in our Christian walk, challenge yourself today. What is the condition of my vessel? Do I need to plug some holes? Do I need to set the ballast in the centre board again? Two, what is my mindset? Have I got the sails ready to capture the Spirit of God, what He has for me? And number three, waiting on the Lord, navigating. We need to navigate this world. There's reefs, there's storms, there's other boats. But as Christians, lean not on our own understanding, but on His, by His power, by His guidance, and by His time. Amen. Let's pray.